Our next speaker is Kimberly Moore. Kimberly is a tax attorney in Washington, D.C. She's a senior partner at the law firm of Hillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, and Pittman. She's also a tireless advocate for animal rights. I met Kimberly two years ago at the Oxford University Animal Ethics Summer School, where she presented two papers on the fur industry. Welcome, Kimberly. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are having a wonderful time here. I'm actually the uh, Director of Public Relations for Fur Free Society. I would like to give a shout out to the uh, organizer of this fantastic event, Rosa Close over here. Thank you. Rosa, Rosa is a real pioneer. She has this crazy, crazy idea that she can stop the fur industry, and I think she actually can. She currently had, and thank you all for coming, actually. Um, I mean, to come out here on a Saturday, and I know that people have traveled um, from the UK, from Israel, um, and I, I congratulate you for coming because you're taking a stand for animals, and, and they do need your help. Um, you are in good company. The Anti-Fur Society, is soon to have, actually, I think she has reached one million followers from all around the globe. Give her a hand. And um, we have upped our game because the fur industry is upping their game. We have formed a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It is Fur Free Society. Um, it is self-funded. We have uh, Rosa Close. Everything that she is able to do, she does it herself. So as you think about the organizations you support, um, I, I would uh, encourage you to consider Fur Free Society, an organization that takes uh, no salaries, um, it's self-funded, and all the expenses of this conference is being funded by this, this wonderful individual here. So thank you again, Rosa. Thank you. Okay, so, and we are up in our game. We're doing billboards. We've been around the world. We're going, we went to Oxford last year. We've doing, we're doing research on the fur industry. We're learning how they think, how they act, because of course, in order to challenge an industry, you've got to understand that industry. And this afternoon, I want to talk about the fur industry and children, which is kind of a bizarre topic, because when you think about the fur trade, you don't naturally think about children, but um, I think we need to do that. And what a, what a sad, sad thing that we actually have to talk to bring children into this discussion with the fur trade, because it's a, it's a brutal and cruel industry. And, and we just don't, we, we don't want children to see that side, but I think it's important that we sort of balance the act with humane education and age-appropriate information because unfortunately what we're seeing is that the fur trade is very active in their advertising to children. So the, the marketing and the research strategists have a long history of marketing to children. We're, we've seen this before. Uh, we've seen them market alcohol, cigarettes, and even guns. And so I wanna ask you a question. The opening question is, who is teaching our children when it comes to fur? And as you can see, over the years, there's been deeply offensive advertisements. I mean, just look at this. Some of the stuff that they put out. I mean, unreal. That baby's drinking alcohol right here. I mean, gosh, let's go to the next slide. That's very, very offensive. So just a little background. Advertising to children is not something new. This has been going on for decades. The FTC actually issued a report, and if you can believe, they actually found that the average child between the ages of 2 and 11 see a staggering 25,000 advertisements each year. That's just really unbelievable. And these companies and industries, like the fur industry, they know that there's a large market to be gained. So, you know, children in high school, they're marketing the children in high school, they're marketing the children in education and they know there's a lot of money to be made in the fur trade as well. So the reality is there are people that spend their entire careers sitting around the table and trying to figure out how they can condition children to become future consumers of fur. 
And the relentless number of advertisements directed towards children stem from this general concept that if you can get children when they're young and familiarize themselves, um, and if you think back to your childhood days, some of the sort of, sort of warm and fuzzy products that you enjoy, they know that the, if you, they can get you when you're at a young age, they can count on you to come back as adults and to be, um, to be supporters and to be consumers. And so this, this whole sort of marketing to children, they know that if you can raise awareness, raise recognition, establish a trust with children, you will have their loyalty when they grow up to be adults. And so marketing, marketing strategists use basic principles of child psychology, if you can imagine that. They get into the heads of little children, and, and rest, make no doubt about it, the fur industry is very familiar with child psychology. So if, if you can sort of um, hold your nose for a moment, and like I said, in order to sort of end the fur trade, which is where we're going, what we're going to do, you have to know your, your competitor. So hold your nose and imagine we're all sitting around a conference table and we want to market fur to children. So how are we going to do that? And again, this is deeply offensive, but bear with me. We would first want to familiarize and desensitize children to the use of fur at a very young age. And the younger, the better. We would want to normalize the use of fur and convince children and convince them that the notion that using fur is sort of natural and that it's not cruel. We would want to connect the use of fur to positive traditions, history, and childhood experiences. And we would want to teach children that you can somehow love animals and still use fur, and that somehow fur-bearing animals in the wild are somehow different from companion animals. We'd also want to sort of reinforce all this information by providing pro fur information to children in classrooms. So what we see in the industry, we see uh, we see direct marketing, and we can see this we can see this actually quite often. So the fur industry knows that children are attracted to sort of bright colors as their eyes are sort of developing. All the infant toys are very bright colored, and children are naturally sort of drawn to that. So you'll see in this, this one ad here, they're wearing beautifully bright fur coats as they dye. And they're also developing sort of lighter weight garments, so children don't want to be, do not want to be weighed down with um, heavy furs. So they're actually trying to make fur garments that are very lightweight for children. And if you can believe it, they're actually having fashion shows where they're bringing children onto the stage wearing fur, and it's sort of like a mommy and me and all this stuff. But this is something new that we haven't seen for very long, but they are really pushing hard to kind of get children used to the idea of fur. And you can see, you know, Barbie dolls, just think, glamorizing. And who liked Barbies growing up? I mean, honestly, Barbie dolls, one of my favorite things in the whole world. And I can tell you as a child, if I saw a little Barbie dog with this fur, oh, I, I mean, gosh, who would not like that? And they know that. They know that little girls, little boys too, love dressing up dolls. And you can almost imagine this is sort of like a loss. Like they're not making money off these Barbie dolls by using fur. They're probably losing money. But they know that if they sort of win children's hearts and minds at a young age, that child will come back as, as an adult, buy a fur coat. And here's some more. Okay. So in addition to um, sort of uh, combining, what they're doing is they're combining the most endearing childhood objects. I mean, imagine a teddy bear here made with real rabbit fur. And this is what they're trying to do. Stuffed animals with real animal fur seek to normalize the use of fur by children at a very young age and to instill the notion and the notion that they can somehow still love animals and when it's still okay to wear fur that is the message we're seeing 
So they're really getting really clever, the marketers, because now what they're doing is they're trying to tie family heirloom concepts with fur. Um, and this is an example of association to something positive. And in this case, it's a teddy bear made with grandma's coat. So what they're doing is they're taking that very special relationship between a grandchild and a grandparent, and they're taking grandma's coat and they're making a teddy bear out of that. So they're trying to sort of take the feelings that you have towards your grandparent and put this in a fur garment. But this, this is actually very much part of the fur trade, and they're not using recycled and yesterday's furs, they're actually slaughtering animals for this sort of thing here. So if you go to one of these heirloom stores, if you don't have grandma's coat, they've got furs lined up for you. So the products that they are making available to children are actually endless. You have um, trinkets and toys. This is actually a keychain. And then as we get into an older class, we've got little pom-poms with fur on there. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to tie fur to something popular. And they're make, trying to make this something that children sort of want and desire and see their brand friends wearing in school. That's, that's sort of like marketing 101. You tie your product to something very popular. Everybody wants it. And the message is that fur is somehow fun or popular. And these are, these are cat and dog toys. So even cat and dog toys are available now with real fur, somehow perpetuating the notion, again, that companion animals are sort of different from these fur-bearing animals. But what it's doing is it's sort of normalizing the use of fur uh, and the use of fur from all animals. So even companion animals are victims of the fur industry by virtue of this sort of association. So for the older youth, they market fur as something that is green and eco-friendly. And they're basically helping consumers legitimize and justify their use of fur. And I hope you stick around later today because I'm doing another talk on fur and the environment. Because you know the, the idea that fur is green and eco-friendly is really their own lifeline. Because they can't defend their product. It's absolutely cruel. And it's such a show as people people sort of learn about fur, they, they don't want to be associated with, with it anymore. And so they kind of put their, their hats on and they see the green economy develop and they see that the public has a real sort of um, sensitivity to things that we do that negatively impact the environment. So they are really pushing the eco-friendly plans, which, is, which uh, are very problematic, which we'll talk about later today. Okay, so in addition to sort of direct marketing to children, we're also seeing indirect marketing. More subtle sort of indirect marketing strategies like using celebrity endorsements and celebrity branding. So celebrities, even their children, are using fur. And I blurred out their faces, so um, I don't like using children even in presentations, but um, these children are actually being used. Their parents have probably received money from the fur trade or fur industry, or they're giving the fur coats for free to wear those. You may remember about six years ago, French Vogue shocked the world when this not this ten-year-old model appeared in a series of very provocative images. So associating fur with youth and beauty is a common marketing strategy. Strategy. But using live animals alongside animal skins is much more subtle. You'll see the two bunnies there. Oh, go back, two. You'll see the two bunnies there, right, sitting right on top of that leopard uh, animal skin. So again, the notion is that you can love companion animals, but forget about all these other animals because they're somehow different. But we know that that's not true. This is just all marketing. So we know that the fur industry, like the larger fashion industry, gifts and loans furs to celebrities. So these are just some um, celebrities that are out and out. It's kind of hard to know uh, what the terms are because these are subject to private contracts. We don't really have privy to the um, fur industry's contractual relationship. But every now and then, something will sort of slip out and we'll learn 
And this arrangement occasionally becomes, um, becomes public. So this, this was this London-based, uh, Lily Allen was given that great box to go around to an awards ceremony. So we, again, we don't usually know the details of these arrangements because they're, they're subject to private contracts. But this goes on an awful lot. And actually the good news is that the FTC is going to get involved. So the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is the agency that regulates marketing and advertising to the public. And their goal is to prevent deceptive and misleading marketing claims. So they're really starting to crack down because what they don't want to see is our celebrities wearing furs who are being paid to wear the fur to make money. Because obviously if you're wearing if you're being paid to wear a fur, it just becomes less authentic and people are less likely to want to, to wear it or to follow you. But if they're sort of just kind of keeping it under the rug and not and not disclosing that they're being paid for the fur, um, it's just very misleading. And so we're really glad to see the FTC crack down on this. So in addition to the direct marketing and the indirect or subtle marketing, we're also finding that industries are actually going into classrooms. And I call this sort of the corporatization of education because they know that there's so much money to make gain in classrooms. And they know that public schools are often strapped for cash. And so what they offer to do is to donate supplies and resources to classrooms that desperately need it. So it's not surprising that the fur industry wants to get, get involved in this. So just to give you an idea, in terms of the product, and this is things like, um, let me give you an example, of candy bars are placed in, you know, M&Ms are placed in the school. Maybe the Maybe the, the candy factory donates candy, and so it kind of goes in for free, but the idea is that you're just getting this free marketing to kids. And it's sort of really deceptive because what happens is children kind of look to their teachers and principals for um, sort of as role models. So if teachers or principals are sort of standing by and these products are being brought into this classroom, there's this automatic assumption, well, this has got to be a good product because my teachers like it or the principal is standing by it. So it's a little, it's a little disturbing and it's obviously not just an issue for the fur trade, it's an industry for, it's an issue for a lot of groups and, and certainly a lot of parents and organizations have, have, have uh, raised this as a specific concern. So just a little bit of background. So when these industries bring research and materials into a classroom, they, act, they actually are very, guess what? No surprise here. Prejudicial towards the product they're trying to sell. They're not going to bring candy in the classroom and say, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible, don't eat it. You know, they're they're going to bring the materials in the classroom to sort of reinforce the idea that, hey, you should be using this product. So, what do we find with the fur trade? The Fur Council of Canada actually has something on their website as a quote educational tool. And this is what I was talking about earlier when I was asking you who is who's educating children in our society. You know, we need we need to think about balancing um, the equation because the fur industry is going into classrooms. Um, this this specific educational tool. It's, it's sort of presented as a teacher's side. It's got quizzes. Um, I watched the video myself. It actually compares animals to water, coal, and plants, if you can imagine that. Now, we know animals are sentient. They actually have feelings, and they can suffer pain, and they're tormented when confined. But you don't hear about any of that in this educational video. It basically tells you that trapping is necessary to balance species in nature. That's amazing, that's amazing. It purports to illustrate key environmental concepts because we know the fur industry are environmental experts, right? They, they, are, <laughs> they are great for the environment, they're not really unjust, but they, they are basically offering an entirely one-sided view of tracking as if nature cannot self-regulate. It needs to, what they're saying is, we need people to go in and trap the balance out species because, well, nature can't do it on its own. 
So these free educational resources are offered on the Berkeley Council's Canadian website. So in addition to in-classroom quizzes and, and all this other nonsense, we find that the trade organizations themselves also go into schools. This is the, the, an ad by the, the Russian Fur Union. It's called the Fur Rainbow Program. And what they do is they teach the fur is an ecological material that can be used year-round. And again, remember, they're making the lighter weight furs for children. Teachers demonstrate different types of fur, and information is offered to steer children into the fur industry, an entirely one-sided view of the fur trade. Now, it's not just places like Russia. It's not that it's just other countries doing this. I looked around and we actually also found the Louisiana Alligator Advisory Council and Louisiana Fur Advisory Council came out with their own set of educational materials. And it's, I'm just going to read a couple of this stuff. Some of the quotes are quite amazing. They say that hunting and trapping has been a way of life for rural people in Louisiana, and the fur trade dates back to the 1700s. So what they're doing, I mean, they're basically setting up a scene where if you challenge fur, they're trying to, they're trying to make you look like you're challenge, challenging history and tradition. You know, and, and those sort of feelings of tradition, and this is the way things have been done, and this is history, are very, very strong effective marketing strategies. If you can tie your product to something that dates back for century, centuries, and, and say it's sort of a central part of life for people, this is how they make their living, I mean, that's brilliant marketing. And that is what we're up against. They go on to say that hunters and trappers have a true love for the land, for the habitat, and for the animals which live here. Wow. So now they are, they, they are basically saying, you know, <laughs> I mean, wow. I just read this every time and I just, uh, if you're trapping and killing animals and you're catching them in these horrific traps, that doesn't seem like that's a lot of love. And I think the animals would probably say that too. Next slide. So they say from the hunters to the tanners to the manufacturers, they all have a passion for their craft. So now they're starting to talk about employment, and this is how people make their money. And so you can see where this is going. If you challenge the fur industry, you're now challenging people's. And how many of us have heard that? Why are you beating up this industry? People are trying to just earn a living and protect and provide for their families. And they kind of make you out to be the bad guy. But this, this is sort of marketing at its best, unfortunately. So it's not just like in places like Russia and Louisiana. There's actually an association of fish and wildlife agencies. They have their own sort of trapper educational program. And you can imagine if you're like in the third or fourth grade, and people come in, you're sort of like below the age at which you can really digest information and be critical of it. It doesn't occur to a five or six year old, or even a seven or eight year old, that someone's trying to like sell you a product. That's sort of your end game. I mean, children are naturally very trusting. And when people come in and someone's telling them that, hey, trapping, now we have tra we've seen the video of trapping is, is probably the most cruelest practice on the planet. But when they come in, they say that there's benefits of trapping to society, it helps disease control. Habitat protection, number three is a real, real favorite of mine. It's endangered species protection. <laughs> because all the research I've read, the trapping, you're actually, for every intended victim in your trap that you're after, you end up catching two unintended victims. And that includes a whole bunch, not only of endangered wildlife, but also domestic cats and dogs. So, I mean, that's amazing. Property protection, wildlife restoration, and wildlife research. It's nonsense. Next slide. So again, the problem of having these groups go directly to the classroom is 
the children believe what they're being told. They're, they see their teachers and their principals as respected role models, and they're thinking, of course, if they're bringing this in the classroom, it has to be true. So they also have fur design competitions because in addition to targeting the very young children with sort of the trinkets and the toys and the Barbie dolls, they're also trying to get some of the up-and-coming youth in fashion to steer them towards fur. So they actually have a number of fur design competitions. So the Hong Kong Fur Federation has their annual fur design competition, and their goal is to identify and nurture local design talent and to encourage young designers to go into fur. They give awards, they pay for trips to places like Milan, for, for students to sort of present their fur designs. And if you can imagine, I mean, how many of us were four students coming out of college, jobless, in debt with student loans, and all of a sudden there's like this competition here. I mean, how powerful is that, really? You know, for some, someone who's never heard of the, the cruelty involved, this is very powerful marketing on their part. The International Fur Federation has the IFF Remax International Student Fur Design Competition. Again, with the goal to introduce young students to fur. It offers, quote, cross-promotional exposure and opportunities. So if you go use their fur and do fur designs, you're going to go far in the fashion world, is, is the message. And they showcase, especially showcase, if you're using fur, your product, your, your design will get front and center attention. The British Fur Trade Association has their own design competition. And again, their goal is to inspire students and young designers to explore fur. They'll give free materials, free classrooms. Again, this is all sort of like, this is just marketing at its best. They're not making money off of these. And they're, they're grooming future manufacturers and designers to continue the fur trade. They give a detailed introduction to the fur trade. They offer cash prizes, trips to Milan, and an internship in London. And by the way, First Free Society also does an internship. We have an, an amazing student help us out. So we're, again, we're upping our game in response to stuff like this. The Japanese Fur Association has their annual GFA Fur Design Contest to promote, quote, to promote the use of fur in fashion globally. Again, cash prices, they're going to pay all the paid expense trips. This is an industry that's getting really desperate. If they have to go out and have all these competitions and get free prizes for fur designs and offer trips, that doesn't sound like an industry that's doing very well. That sounds like an industry that's quite desperate. So what are we going to do? So <laughs> it's kind of a lot to absorb, but the message here is that the fur industry is actively marketing to children, both young children and old, older children. And the good news is the idea of marketing to ch children in general is on the radar of a number of organizations. It's not just those who are socially sort of offended by uh, fur as cruel. It's, there's just the marketing in general of products is a big problem. Because the American Psychological Association tells us that children aged eight and under are not able to understand that what they're seeing is a marketing advertisement for a product. So basically they say, this is the American Psychological Association, you shouldn't be marketing or trying to sell products to children if you're under the age of eight. Now that may be true also for children above the age of eight, so they recommend sort of looking and sort of doing more studies on the nine, 10, and up to see sort of, you know, what age do children really get that they're being marketed to. Remember, the, the study that was done by the FTC, the average child in the general year, and I think that was like 15 years ago, uh, see, they sold the 25,000 advertisements in one year. So people are being marketed to, when they don't even know it. You're watching this show, people are wearing garments, or eating products, it just is nonstop. And they say, look, under the age of eight, you shouldn't be marketing at all. So that's, that's very helpful, and clearly something like the fur industry should not be marketing to children at any age. The Responsible Advertising and Children Program Group. Now, this, this is the group that sort of represents marketers and agencies. So, of course, 
they they don't want to ban. They want the opposite. They want to basically be able to market whatever they want to children, regardless of age, regardless of venue. And what they're saying is, don't worry about the marketing world. We'll self-govern ourselves. We'll just create rules. We'll be responsible. Um, don't worry about us. Obviously, that's not a solution that works. The Federal Business Bureau also has a division. It's called the Children's Advertising Review Unit. And they, they, their approach to this, and again, these are just organizations that have kind of looked at marketing to children in general, and they're, coming, they're each coming out with their own strategies. So, so this group says, you got to recognize that children sort of have a limited capacity to appreciate that they're being marketed to. And they, they, their goal is where they say, capitalize on your ability to make children better citizens. So encourage them to do positive things like tell the truth and be kind, but it's just far too vague, especially when an industry like the fur industry is bringing educational materials into a classroom. And these sort of like general guidelines, number one, they're not enforceable, but they're not sort of, they don't get to the heart of where we're at, is that children are being marketed to to be future consumers of fur. So the issue of marketing to children is actually not only on people's radar at the national level, but the UNICEF group, which UNICEF is the, is the group that um, works and they represent children's interests worldwide. And they actually commissioned a global report that came out with the law firm, Piper Mulberry did it, in um, 2016. And they basically were looking at the global issue of marketing to children. They, they wanted to do a study to see where are countries at? What are their rules? What are the regulations? Are there any age limitations under which you can't market the children? And essentially, they found very little sort of strict guidelines. I won't take you through the entire report, but, but essentially, they found that countries, countries that lack, basically found to lack explicit national legislation addressing marketing to children include a whole host of countries. You can see uh, Brazil, Canada, Chile, blah, blah, blah. There's some countries that have some provisions, but they are by far nowhere near sufficient to stop the type of educational activities that are happening in classrooms. There are a few countries that have more substantial and complete provisions, but again, it's not enough on a worldwide basis when you have an internet that's bringing information around the globe. So where does this all lead? So when I opened this talk, I said I asked the question, who is, who is teaching children? Because I think where all this leads us, we have, we have some policy guidelines that are helpful or they're not binding. We have the marketing sector itself that kind of realizes there is an issue, but they're not quite ready to commit to ban marketing to children. And so the growth that all in take us to the same place, and that is humane education. So if we want to get up from the conference room that we were at earlier, you know, we were sitting around a conference room, we were kind of brainstorming, and we were trying to market for the children. We thought about all the things, as repugnant as they were, that we would need to do to ensure that children buy fur as an adult. We're going to get up from that conference room and come over to the humane conference room. So now we want to think about what can we do to make sure that children get the other side of the story. And this is where humane education comes in. So now it's just us. We are at this table. So what we need to do, we need to sensitize children to the cruelty involved with fur at a young age. And of course, age-appropriate humane education, they need not see those horrific videos. But they need to understand that fur comes from a living creature and that it's best to keep the fur where it belongs in its owner. We would want to educate children on the cruelty involved with fur farming and trapping. And remember that Louisiana set of educational materials? This really needed to be pulled from that classroom. Deeply offensive because they're sending the message that trapping it has all these benefits. But we know the real story, don't we? We would also want to normalize use of cruelty-free clothing because they're trying to normalize use of fur. We have to normalize use of cruelty-free clothing. We have to encourage, we have to 
teach children and connect the fur on the little keychains and pom-poms that we saw and the Barbie dolls, that this came from a, a living, sentient being. And explain to children, what does sentient mean? That means that the animal can feel pain, it suffers in the cage, it doesn't want to die, it doesn't want to languish in a tight, cramped, uh, uh, fur-farming cage, it wants to be free. And I think we need to talk with children about the ethics of taking skin from an animal, especially when it's not needed, and especially given the price that animals pay with their lives. And we need to do the opposite of what the fur industry is doing. We need to help children make the connection that if you love animals, you don't wear them. I mean, that has to be the simplest, simplest lesson to be taught. And in response to all this sort of industry-driven information in classrooms, we would want to provide the opposite, cruelty-free information to children at a young age. And some people may say, well, you're just doing the same thing that you just criticized the industry. You're not supposed to be marketing to children because they are under, under the age of eight, they're not capable of understanding that you're trying to market them and you're doing the same thing. And of course, that's the response that I got when I made this suggestion. But I think it's a little different because the trade groups come in, they are profit-minded, right? They have a goal to sell, and make, sell products and make money. We're not doing that with humane education. We're simply saying, here's the reality. This is the cruelty involved with this product. We're not trying to make money. We're trying to educate. So I think there is a really big difference. And this this little book, I'm not sure if this is on sale here, but this this is is it excellent. Okay. So this little book is exactly the type of things we need to see in classrooms. And I'm seeing more and more people, you know, the, the war against the fur trade will not be won by politicians or lawyers or corporations. The war against the fur trade is going to be won by grassroots activists, and that's you. So by all means, anyone in here can do this. This is Rosa, she, she, she authored and, and did this beautiful little book about a little fox wanting to save his own coat. And that's exactly what we need to see. Okay, so to sum up, I just wanted to put a few of the organizations up here. I mean, the idea of humane education is growing tremendously. Next year at Oxford, you're actually going to dedicate a whole conference to humane education. And fur-bearing animals need all the humane education they can get. Um, I invite you to take a look at any of these sites. But ultimately, I think, again, educating children doesn't have to be um, difficult or sophisticated or even organized. You know, it's going to take a grassroots movement to educate children in classrooms, in communities, in your neighborhood, and anywhere. And I think that's what we need to sort of counter all this marketing for the children. So that's it. Thank you so much.